Welcome to the Doggy Dojo. I'm your host, Susan Light. I'm a Los Angeles-based dog trainer on a quest to become worthy of the title Sensei of the Doggy Dojo. Today's episode is a crossover episode with the Jack Russell Parents podcast. Last year, I spoke to hosts Becca and Gabe about how to stop unwanted barking, and they invited me back this year to talk about leash reactivity. Now, the amazing Juliana Willems joined me last season to talk about reactive dogs, and she did a fantastic job covering the topic. But reactivity is on the rise, and I don't think we can talk too much about or offer too much positive reinforcement support for pet parents who are dealing with leash reactivity. So I hope you enjoy this episode discussing leash reactivity with Becca and Gabe of the Jack Russell Parents Podcast. We have with us today certified dog trainer and legit podcaster, founder of Doggy Dojo, Susan Light. Hi, Susan. Hi. When we asked you what the hottest issue is that you have encountered in the training world, you mentioned reactivity. We had talked with you previously about reactivity in relation to barking. So let's continue that conversation, but maybe with the focus more on leash reactivity that I think maybe we aren't using the correct term, but we say like leash defensiveness. Mm -hmm. So what does leash reactivity look like in a dog? Leash defensiveness is actually not a term I've heard, but it's, it's not a bad use for it, but we say leash reactivity. It looks a lot like barking and lunging towards the end of the leash. Mm -hmm. So very similar to the reactivity we talked about since barking is a major symptom, you know, it's part of it. Yeah. But also when we were talking about like Carson barking at the mailman, we tend to call that barrier reactivity or or dogs that are barking on their fence. Like if you leave your dog in the backyard and bark every time somebody goes past the fence, we call that barrier reactivity. So leash reactivity is very specific to you're out walking your dog on the leash and they see something and they bark and they lunge to the end of the leash. Yes. So that is what Carson does. (laughs) (laughs) It's so common. My episode last season on leash reactivity is still the most downloaded episode and it tells me that and it's probably it's like half of the cases that i see in person as well yeah so it's super super common yeah it's a sore point for us because when carson was little he loved everybody and everything he'd walk up to cats as if they were dogs he loved every person every dog Mm -hmm. and then um Life has jaded his little heart. (laughs) (laughs) He's not friendly with everyone anymore. No, he gets, it's almost like he gets defensive, like preemptively, you know, like, yeah, I'm going to be tough. So you don't come after me because he's been attacked a couple of times. Yeah. So one of the things that I did want to say, and I'm glad you guys mentioned that, is that if you're dealing with leash reactivity, depending on how severe it is, you can just manage it and live with it. And a lot of people do. But if you want to actually make progress with leash reactivity, you need to be working with a trainer because it's really easy to make it worse. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I could see that. Yeah. And then it just gets worse and worse and worse until you can't walk your dog anymore. Yeah. So what are common causes of leash reactivity? There's nuance, obviously, but I find reactivity has two roots and one is fear and the other is frustration. Mm. And you can actually see both in the same dog because it's situational. Frustration based reactivity would be like the very social puppies that just want to go say hi to every dog they see. Yeah. Um, Or also the dog that wants to chase the squirrel that they just saw on the tree. Right. So that's frustration. based. They're like, get me off this leash so I can go do the thing I want to do. Yeah, that's frustration based reactivity. And then there's fear based reactivity where even though it seems very aggressive, it's like you said, defensive. Mm -hmm. They're actually trying to say, stay away from me. I'm scary because (laughs) they're afraid. Exactly. Yeah. 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 And so you can see both in the same dog in different situations where they're frustrated because they want to chase the squirrel and then they're scared of the other dog or they're afraid of something else. Mm -hmm. But more often than not, we'll see one or the other. Mm -hmm. The frustration being in the young dogs that are very, very social and the fear-based in really any age dog. For Carson, his frustration comes out, you know, he's like that little toddler in the grocery store. He'll just lie down in the (laughs) aisle. Oh my God. He'll lie down in the middle. Yeah. He'll lie down in the street and he will not move. Yeah. And I'm like, you're kidding me. (laughs) Well, at least you could pick him up. Worst case scenario. Yeah. You know, imagine if you had a bigger dog. (laughs) Yeah, that's true. (laughs) That would be worse. Yeah. And that's another reason to work with a trainer is if you have a large muscular dog, 
reactivity gets very scary. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's scary for you. You can actually get injured trying to hold your dog back, depending on how determined they are pulling on you. Yeah. The dog can get injured, straining against, depending on what kind of equipment you're using. Right. And then of course, depending on the severity, were they to actually get to what they're trying to get to the other dog or whatever, Right. obviously there's an opportunity for them to bite them. Lots of reasons to make sure that you're working with a trainer. Yeah. So with that in mind, uh, what are the best ways to treat or cope with this? Yeah. So the first step is going to the vet. Take your dog to the vet. Anytime you're looking at a behavior uh, that is undesirable, you actually first want to make sure there's not a medical issue. Mm -hmm. That's true if you just adopted this dog. And it's also true if it's a new behavior. It's especially true if it's a new behavior. Because dogs are really good at covering sickness and injury and pain. Ah, yeah. And so a lot of times those things show up as behaviors. That's number one. Gotcha. This is why we go in this order is because at each of these steps, it may solve your problem without moving on to the next step. Right. If Obviously, if there's a medical reason, you're done. Mm -hmm. You know, you get the dog treatment and you're done. And also a lot of times if it's not completely curing it, it's helping the severity. So a dog that's in pain is going to be extra grumpy, you know, (laughs) so they're going to be harder to deal with. So start at the vet. Okay. Um, And number two is management. So we talked about this with the barking. You want to make sure that they can't practice the behavior. So if management for your dog means you can't go on walks, then that's what it means. Mm -hmm. You know, that means you just pop out for potty breaks and we don't go on walks because we don't want them practicing this behavior because every time you practice something, you're building neural pathways in the brain and creating a habit. Yeah. And it gets stronger and stronger. So this is how you can make it worse. You just keep doing it over and over again. Mm -hmm. It's like you said, suddenly now Carson's preemptively barking at them anytime he sees them because he's in that habit. So the second step is always management. To make real behavior change, you have to stop them from rehearsing the behavior. Yeah. And then the third step is you got to make sure you're meeting the dog's needs. If you can't take your dog on a walk, they still need exercise, right? So you're going to make sure that you're meeting that need some other way with some fetch or some tug or a flirt pull or some other ways that you can exercise them. All behavior has a function. That behavior, believe it or not, that you don't like is telling you that they have an unmet need. That's very interesting. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. So you need to find out how to meet that need in a better way. Mm-hmm. We call this step enrichment. And I'm sure you've heard that phrase, canine enrichment. And there are Facebook groups about canine enrichment and there are books. And it's really, really about meeting the dog's needs. I think people get distracted by like puzzle feeders (laughs) (laughs) and they think that's all enrichment is. And puzzle feeding is is great because it, it it's like foraging and it's mental stimulation. And so it's a big part of meeting a dog's needs, but it's not the only part of enrichment. There's a great book called Canine Enrichment for the Real World, which I totally recommend. Um, Emily Strong and Allie Bender wrote it and they break it down. It's like 12 or 13 aspects or needs that dogs have that can be met um, and they give you ideas of how to meet them. One of them is safety and security, which we're going to talk about. One of them is mental stimulation. One is physical stimulation, social ability, things like that. And so you can go down the list and say, hmm, are we meeting that need? Here's some ways through enrichment that I can try to meet that need. Gotcha. And so if you meet all your dog's needs, they don't have to go out and try to meet them themselves in a way that you don't care for. Okay. That makes sense. Yeah. Fourth step, which is we're going to do counter conditioning and desensitization. And that's where we need to know whether it's frustration or fear based, because we can go back to that third step and say, okay, if it's frustration because they want to go meet the dogs, that they need some social interaction. You have a social dog. So you need to find a way to meet that. And it's not by saying hi to all the dogs you see on leashes when you walk. (laughs) Right. Yes. Agreed. I actually tell my clients to stop letting dogs say hi to dogs on leashes. Just stop it. Yeah. Because whichever cause of reactivity that your dog has, stopping the on-leash greetings will help with either one. Because if they're social and they want to go say hi to this dog, as soon as you 
break the habit and say, no, we don't say hi to dogs when we're on leash. We play with dogs in the backyard that we invited over or other, you know, safe social interactions that are off leash. Then they stop getting frustrated because they stop thinking that you're going to go see that dog. You know, the worst thing you can do is go see the dog sometime yeah. and not other times because then they have no, they're frustrated. They have no idea what's going on. Mm, yeah, that makes sense. I think that's one of the things that's the most difficult with walking them is, is someone else. Yeah. You know, we don't all feel the same way about it. Yep. <laughs> yeah. So, and so I put in my hand up like, yep. stop, like don't approach me, please. <laughs> yeah. Because I'm like, I'm sure your dog's great and all, but I don't yes. know how my dog's going to react and I don't want there to be an issue. So just please stay on your side of the street. And so I feel like people think that I'm rude most of the yeah. time, but I'm yeah. just like, look, I can't afford a, an yep. incident. And you know what kills me is when you do all this, you're like, no, no, no. And they come anyway. And then they get all offended that your dog barks at them. Yes. I and know. it's like, I was trying to tell you <laughs> that this was going to happen. Yes. There's actually whole niches that have sprung up with like clothes and harnesses and leashes that are like, leave us alone. Don't talk to us. Don't greet us. My dog doesn't want to say hi. Um, and that shows that people are dumb and won't listen to you when you just tell them not to say hi to your dog. Right. So it's human nature. We're like gravity towards dogs, mm -hmm. which is great because we love them. But you're absolutely right. You have to be the one that says, you know, we, we can't say hi. What's great is in coronavirus. Now you can sort of cross the street. Right. When you see them coming and seem a little less rude. That's right. <laughs> I teach my dogs in a, an emergency U-turn. So if you see someone, you just turn around. That's when Carson lies down in the street. Yeah. So... <laughs> <laughs> he's like uh, people think that uh he's very well behaved that we train him to lie down and when he, when until he someone passes but he does that because he will refuse we to can't do a u-turn you know? he wants to say hello to people yeah so you so you want to meet that social need of his in another way and teach him like we're not going to do this on the leash but we're still going to meet that need for you so that i think is hard for people because you need to meet people with dogs that are convenient to you so that they can hang out. I think it's great for dogs to have friends. Dogs are usually like people on a social spectrum. Some dogs all the way on one end are truly aggressive. And if they get near any dog, they're going to bite them. Okay. That's an aggressive dog. That's pretty rare to be honest, but they do exist. And then on the other end of the spectrum is, and most dogs start out here, is the super, super friendly to everyone. Anything loves everybody. Can't, can't upset them. Super social dog. Mm -hmm. uh, but most dogs fall somewhere in between where they like some dogs and they don't like other dogs. They like some people and they don't like other people. They can handle two or three dogs, but you throw them in the dog park with 50 and it's too much. Uh, you know, and that's all normal. That's all normal to have on that spectrum. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. But you want to meet that need wherever that is. Um, and then if the frustration is prey drive, right, because they want to chase squirrels and things then you want to obviously teach them a good leave it and a good drop it, but you want to give them some enrichment that falls into that hunting, prey, chasing thing so that they can still do that. Yeah. You're not going to train out prey drive from a dog there. It's hardwired into their genetics. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Right. Especially yeah. Jack Russell. Man. So he... exactly. We're going to take a quick break, but if you find Becca and Gabe as charming as I do, make sure to check out the Jack Russell Parents podcast on your favorite podcast app. It's linked along with their social media handles in the show notes. We'll be right back. And, <laughs> and then, so all of that is to get us to what we would consider, quote unquote, the actual training part, where we're going to train them to hopefully be less reactive. Mm -hmm. And that's the counter conditioning and desensitization. But you can see like all these parts that go into an actual like behavior plan to try to make behavior change. Mm -hmm. When we set up management, we said, we're not going to put them in a situation, depending on how reactive your dog is, you might be able to walk them as long as you stay at least 20 feet from other things turning around, crossing the street, whatever. But then when you're ready to actually train and desensitize and counter condition, you want to make sure you have like the yummiest, best treats ever. Yeah. <laughs> uh, it takes a very, very high value treat, which, you know, I would say like cheese or beet or something very, very smelly, but every dog will determine that themselves. This is not time for Cheerios, kibble, 
dry milk bones at all. This has to be like something super, super yummy, super tasty, super smelly. And we're going to do a game called Look at That. And that is the cornerstone of desensitization work. Something that I teach my clients very, very first time that I meet them is look and touch. Is that something you guys ever taught Carson? Okay, maybe oh. he he does not look at me. You might have a different cue for it. Focus is another one that people use for it. Whatever you use, it's basically a cue for your dog to look at you and to hold your eye contact. And then touch is a hand target where they bop their nose on your outstretched hand, mm. right? So I hold out my hand and they bop their nose on it. Touch is super, super useful skill. And the, what's great about those two skills is they redirect their focus. So look, obviously they have to look at you and they have to look away from whatever they're looking at to look at you and touch. They have to physically move their body to touch your hand target. And so those are two things that we use to redirect a dog without yanking them on their leash. We, we've we actually done that unofficially now that I come okay. to think of it because, yeah. uh, it's look at me. She does that to me too. Look at me. <laughs> right. You've got Gabe trained. That's yeah. right. <laughs> and for Carson, we do give a kiss. So we put our hand out and he, he gives okay. a yeah, kiss. Okay. Yeah, that's right. Oh. It works. It really calms him down in a lot of situations. Yeah. So I literally do this. It's the first thing I teach anybody. And it, I use it all the time all the time. There's so many contexts that you can use it. And counter conditioning and desensitization is definitely one of them. The first thing to understand is a concept called threshold, which we talked about this a little bit when we talked about barking, which is like when they're losing it barking, they're not going to listen to when you say quiet, right? right? Even if it's something that they know because they're over threshold. And that just means they're not in their thinking part of their brain. They're in their instinctual part of their brain. Their hormones have taken over their, it's that fight, flight, freeze thing, right? So we want to keep them in their thinking brain. And we just call that being under threshold. And that's a super important part of dealing with reactivity because it's only when they're in their thinking part of their brain that we can start to try to convince them that these things are not dangerous, that they're afraid of. So we use that with look at that. And the basic of look at that is they look at, we, so we call it a stimulus. So whatever it is, the squirrel, the other dog, the person, the mailman, whatever it is that causes that reactivity, the barking, the lunging, whatever, they look at it and they look back at you without the barking, crazy reactivity. And that's a rep. And they get a yummy best treat they ever had for that. And you have to do that enough times where they're far enough away that they start to actually really look at it. And then they sort of think, oh, there's, hmm, why was I freaked out about that? <laughs> right? it, it sounds simple. It takes a long time, <laughs> but, but that's the concept behind it, right? So the idea is you have to have enough distance is usually what we use to keep them under threshold. So if they're 50 feet away and they're able to look at that dog calmly, then ask for a look back at you and then they get the treat. And then you just wait, you wait for them to look back at it and then look back at you. And when you do it enough times, it actually becomes a cue to them. Okay. To every time they see something that makes them nervous to look back at you. And when they get some comfort and some treats from you, be like, yeah, everything's fine. That helps them feel more confident and more safe. Hmm. And so then you're able to sort of shrink the distance slowly, but you're always watching them, always watching them. If they've started barking and freaking out, it's too close. I like that. Yeah. Yeah. And so at that point, go ahead. You can try to give them a treat. You don't even have to ask for them to look away. Just go ahead and try to give them a treat because the act of eating will actually calm them down enough that you may be able to then get them to look at you and walk away. If they won't take the treat, that's when you're doing the U-turn, trying to get as far out of there as you can. This is where we tend to make the mistake and we pull on their leash, right? And try to yank them away or yell at them, stop, stop. And that's where we make it worse because instead of pairing that thing they're afraid of with, I'm calm. How are you? Here's a lovely treat. Oh, everything's safe. We're pairing it with, oh my God, I'm getting yanked. I'm getting yelled at. This is the worst. Gotcha. It's too so late to try it. Yeah. All that mm -hmm. emotion into the next time they see it. And that's how it gets worse instead of better. Right. Right. Wow. And that's also why 
especially for reactivity. Now, I don't think you should use these tools ever, aversive tools, but especially for reactivity and especially anything based in fear, mm. using aversive prong collars, shock collars, uh, slip collars, just make it worse. Absolutely. Yeah. Because, you know, they're already in this fear state and you're, you're hurting them. You're causing them this discomfort. You're yank, you know, I see it all the time. People just yanking on their dogs and prong collars or shocking their dogs being like, shut up. If you think about what you're doing to this dog, you're, you're just spiraling down. And this is yeah. actually can create an actual aggressive dog that just keeps escalating it to where every time they see something, they're so freaked out. Wow. Yeah. You know what I mean? And that's where you get the dogs that sometimes have to be put down. I'm oh, not saying that reactive people create or owners of reactive dogs create reactivity by any means, because I've told you how common it is, right? It's super, super common, but people who try to punish dogs that are experienced fear, make it worse. That's just the truth. Yeah, absolutely. Oh my gosh. Yeah. That makes a lot of sense. So you want to try to keep them under threshold, lots of distance and that look, touch and emergency U-turn to try to exit yourself out of a situation. If you, if they came towards you too fast or you, you thought they could handle it, but they freak out to just try to get out of it in as easy, quick and positive way as you can so that you're not yanking, yelling, making it worse. Yeah, that's that's really helpful. A lot of great advice. A lot of good I, marriage advice as well. <laughs> <laughs> it's amazing how much animal behavior and human behavior is similar. It is. Yeah. I mean, you know, just think about that. If you were if you're afraid about something as a person mm -hmm. and then you get I'm going to use the word abused, frankly, mm -hmm. like then you yeah. get hit or abused during yeah. that while you're already afraid. That ain't going to help anything. <laughs> yeah. And it also isn't going to help your frustration. Like yeah. if it's based in frustration, it's the same thing. It's like I the other day was trying to airdrop something and it wouldn't work. And I just kept doing it over and over again. And I was like, ah, why isn't this working? Yeah. Like if somebody had smacked me right then, would not have made me feel better. <laughs> it would have escalated it, I think. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Yeah. So it's like people discount frustration as something that our animals feel. When you are frustrated, it's a horrible feeling. It is. You're right. It's a horrible feeling and you can't do anything about it and you don't understand what's happening. That's where these, especially young dogs or high prey dogs that are trying to get to things when they're on the leash, the look at that works because it's just teaching them that we're not going to chase it and you can be calm around it. So that's why it doesn't really matter if it's frustration or fear, the protocol's the same. Yeah. But again, you, you always want to be as positive as you can. We're trying to recondition, classic condition, pairing something that frustrates or makes them afraid with good things, with calmness, with the best food they ever had. And then that can sort of change the way that they feel about it. Yeah. Because this is ultimately not obedience training. It's not. We're changing the way that they feel. Right. Oh, that's great. Yeah. Well, we know that we took a lot of your barking advice and it's resulted <laughs> in much better behaviors yes. with Carson. Yay! I mean, the trash truck still comes and he still has a reaction to it, yeah. but it's so much easier to calm him down now yeah. than it used to be. Yeah. Yay. Fantastic. Uh, I'm I'm sure that this will work too. So we're going to re-listen to this am, episode a bunch of times. And I'm going to, yes. I'm so glad. So there's a lot of elements to it. It's simple, but it's also because it's simple, it's easy to do it wrong. Mm -hmm. The thing to remember, so remember we started with the vet mm -hmm. all the way back at the end now when we've done all this in place is if you can't find an under threshold place to work on this, then you need to see a, a behaviorist and get some medication involved. That makes sense. The medication is not going to fix it. And a really good veterinary behaviorist or behaviorist actually wants to know that you're working with a trainer. Like it, it could be a three-way appointment, you know, bring your trainer to the appointment or have them zoom in. Yeah. Because all you're trying to do, it's sort of like someone who's having a panic attack or it has an anxiety disorder. Like sometimes you need medication just to keep you even enough to work through it, if that makes sense. It does. Absolutely. Yeah. So it's certainly not every dog that needs it. It's not a solution to just, you know, oh, I'm going to give him this med and everything's going to be fine. But if you're starting to work on it and you're like, wow, I, I tried 50 feet, I tried 100 feet. I, you know, there, it's impossible for me to keep what's freaking them out far enough away to start working on this, then you, you're going to have to get some medication involved. Cool. Well, thank you so much for this, this information. This is going to be so helpful, I know, to us and hopefully to everybody listening. 
Thank you, Becca and Gabe, for having me on your show again. I love talking to you guys. Becca and Gabe do a fun round of questions at the end of their interviews, but if you want to hear that, you'll have to check out this episode over on their feed. You can find the Jack Russell Parents podcast linked in the show notes. Thank you for stopping by the dojo to learn with me this week. This is your aspiring sensei, Susan Light, signing off. You can find me at doggydojopodcast.com or I'm Susan Light LA on Instagram, Pinterest, and Facebook. The music was written by Mac Light. You can find him at maclightsongwriter.com. If you like the show, you can support it by subscribing, sharing it with your friends, rating it, and reviewing on Apple Podcasts. I'll be back in two weeks with another new episode of The Doggy dojo